Before I begin speaking on this particular verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, which is centers around the life of Maharaj Fritu, I'd like to give a little background to the talk. And that is um, prior to Prithu Maharaja's appearance on the planet, there was one, one very nefarious king. His name was King Vena. The story of King Vena is mentioned in the earlier part of this same canto. King Veda ultimately was the, you might say in one sense, the father of King Prithu. But King Veda was, uh, although a king, he deviated drastically from religious principles and became actually quite evil in his rule. So much so that uh, he asked the Brahmanas to perform sacrifices because for his benefit, because he is the king and he is actually God himself. He said, why perform sacrifices to worship the Supreme when I am the actual Supreme, you should worship me. So um, in his rule, he had stopped all religious ceremonies and had put the Brahmins aside and uh, continue to act in a very, what we say, irreligious way. The only thing good about his rule was that he was so cruel by nature that the thieves and rogues that were in society fled in fear of him. And therefore crime pretty much stopped in his kingdom. But that was a byproduct of his rule because his rule was centered around getting personal worship, honor, he wasn't so much into uh, material acquisition as he was into self-centered uh, aggrandizement. And he, as being the king, he felt himself as good as God or God himself. So the Brahmins tolerated him for some time and finally they made their petitions against the King Vena. Vena and then uh, he uh, pretty much said, I don't even need you Brahmins anymore. So, uh, you know, he pretty much dispensed with the idea of Brahminical council, Brahminical culture. This became too much. The Brahmins at that day, they were quite powerful. They had been powerful for a long time. And so they got together and performed some sacrifice. And by that sacrifice, they were able to kill the King Venu directly from his body was as it's explained in the Srimad Bhagavatam his body was churned and out of the churning of his body came one very horrible person but then from the churning of a body because King Vena's father was a very pious and religious king prior to that um, he was mixed King Vena Vena's mother was a pretty much an evil person and his father was pious and religious. Uh, interesting combination. The father was a king and he had 
a few wives. And one of the wife was actually kind of like a demoness. <laughs> so that was the birth of King Vena. And therefore he had, the, he had the qualities of his mother, as it says in the, uh, I think it's in the Pancharatriki, that the son takes on the qualities of the mother and the daughter takes on the qualities of the father. That is a general principle. It's not an absolute principle, but it has, it has value. And Prabhupada often spoke in that same way. There seems to be something on the screen, Sri Devi, that is kind of blocking part of the screen. Do you see that? I don't know what that is. If you can take remove that from the screen. Yeah. Now it's covering the verse. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, now King Vena, I mean, King Vena is dead and King Pritu, who was actually a partial incarnation of, a, he was actually a Shaktavesh avatar who came to rule the world after this evil king. Um, he uh, was empowered to uh, reestablish saintly rule. So one of the things he noticed when he first got into power is that the, the citizens were complaining for a lack of necessities in life. There wasn't enough foodstuffs in the general sense for, for the general population. And this was due to the fact that prior King Vena had committed so many sinful activities and therefore Mother Earth started to withhold her bounties in general. But then after King Vena was killed, um, he, uh, she continued to hold, withhold because the rogues and thieves again became prominent in society. And then King Vena, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, King uh, Maharaj Pritu, well, after being petitioned by the citizens about the dire consequences of suffering for lack of them and the necessities of life, all because of Mother Earth was not allowing it to come, um, he pursued Mother Earth and he was able to cause her to incarnate as a cow. And then he, of course, uh, became very angry with her why she was... Uh, holding these things and then there is a series of verses to get her to answer why she did that in fact he wanted to kill mother earth who took the form of a cow and you can read the discussions in the earlier part of this chapter this chapter is called maharaj Pritu becomes angry at the earth so this particular verse i'm going to read of today's class and this is where he catches up with the earth he's very angry that she's not producing what is necessary for the population to live and then so we can read the verse om namo bhagavate vasudevaya om namo bhagavate vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Amusam Shu Paritanam Paritanam Artanam Paridevitam Samayashyami Madbanayar Vindayas Tabame Visa. Translation. Now, with the help of my arrows, I shall cut you. In to pieces, and with your flesh, satisfy the hungry, stricken citizens who are now crying for want of grains. Thus, I shall satisfy the crying citizens of my kingdom. So he is angry because the citizens are not getting what they need to live. Here's the purport. If you can bring clarity to the words on the page, that would be nice. They seem to be in a very blurry position. I don't know why that. Is like that. 
Mother Lavanya, can you step in and help out? Yes, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. Mataji, I think your internet connection is weak. Um, it, we are unable okay. to see the report. Shall I share the screen? Um, yes, yeah. please. Okay, that is much better. Okay. Here's Srila Prabhupada's purport. Here we find some indication how the government can arrange for the eating of cow flesh. It is indicated here in rare circumstances when there is no supply of grains. The government sanctioned the eating of meat. However, when there is sufficient just to satisfy the fastidious tongue. In other words, in rare circumstances, when people are suffering from want of grains, meat eating, or flesh eating, can be allowed, but not otherwise. The maintenance of slaughterhouses for the satisfaction of the tongue and the killing of animals unnecessarily should never be sanctioned by a government. As previously as described in the previous verse, cows and other animals should be given sufficient grass to eat. And despite if despite a sufficient supply of grass, a cow does not supply milk, and if there is an accurate shortage of food, the dried up cow may be utilized to feed the hungry masses of people. According to the law of necessity, first of all, human society must try to produce food, grains, and vegetables. But if they fail in this, they can indulge in flesh eaters, otherwise not. A human society is presently structured as human societies is presently structured, there is sufficient production of grains all over the world. Therefore, the opening of slaughterhouses cannot be supported. And in some nations, there is so much surplus grain that sometimes extra grain is thrown into the productions of grains. The conclusion is that the earth produces sufficient grain to feed the entire population but the distribution of, re of grain is restricted due to trade regulations and the desire for profit. Consequently, in some places, there is a scarcity of grain and other, others profuse production. If there were one government on the surface of the earth to handle the distribution of grain, there would be no question of scarcity, no necessary necessity of opening slaughterhouses, and no need to present false theories of overpopulation. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhar, Sri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktivinoda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So uh, in this particular sequence of verses, and particularly this verse, we see the uh, adamant nature of a saintly king. He is concerned about the welfare of the citizens who are now in want. They were in want because of the previous administration. And uh, due to that sinful rule, um, the earth was no longer receiving the sacrifices needed from Brahmins and people's religious activities were stopped. Mm -hmm. Consequently, people became what we say morose and uh, the government became the exploiter of the citizens. And then what happened is now the administration changes into a saintly king, but the situation on earth is not any better. Mother Earth is still withholding. King Pritu has not really begun his um, his rule as a king, so sacrifices, and you'll see as you, as you read on in these series of chapters, he brings about abundance back to all the citizens in in immense qualities that people, everything is flourishing all over the world. So this was the, um, he, he could be likened or compared to King Yudhisthira 
when Yudhisthira took the throne right after the battle of Kurukshetra, then the earth again was producing so many necessities in abundance. Uh, so here Prabhupada talks about something a little concessionary <laughs> in the sense that when there is not sufficient grain for production all over the world, there may be a necessity out of an emergency, and that's the point is being made, that people may eat foods that are not generally get, uh, allowed to be eating, in such cases here, flesh eating. But this is concessionary, it is not something to be even considered because as long as there are religious activities around the world, there will be sufficient grains produced. And as you see here in Prabhupada's particular purport, he says in some areas there is scarcity and in other areas profuse production. So why is that? Is because of some areas are more pious, religious, and free from sinful activity, and other places are not. And so therefore, Mother Earth is responding because she is the uh, agent for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and she works under his direction. This whole particular pastime is being played out to show the glories of King uh, Pritu and how he brings everything back to uh, abundance around the world. So there's always sufficient amounts of uh, food available through Mother Nature. As Prabhupada also points out, in some places there are so much grains available that in order to keep prices from, uh, keep prices up, in other words, when there is much supply, the, the prices go down. When there is scarcity, there is competition and prices go up. So here it's mentioned that um, we find, and this is something that uh, we have been personally experiencing in my early days of, of Krishna consciousness, there were many reports of uh, grains, wheat, and other foodstuffs, even milk, thrown into the ocean in order to allow for economic profit for in the hands of a few people. Well, this is extremely sinful because there are people who are who could use these items, so there's no need to waste them and throw them away. But because governments are not governed by religious or even moral principles, everything is centered around economic gain. So we have a, a great problem. But here is another point that um, sometimes there is there's this one false theory and Prabhupada mentions it in the very end, that there are too many people on the earth. Um, and therefore, the earth cannot supply what people need. And therefore, there should be a reduction of population in order to facilitate the needs of the people in the world. So this there was a person called Thomas Malthu, Malthus, and he was very, he wrote books and made presentations on this idea that we need to have wars, we need to have pestilence, we need to have famines in order to get rid of a portion of the population which will keep a balance on the earth and therefore then people who are living on the earth won't, won't have to suffer from a scarcity or what we say inequality, an imbalance like this. But Srila Prabhupada smashes this theory in many of his statements, especially in journey to journey to self-discovery. He discusses this in this particular book in detail, where he says the earth can produce 10 times more than what the what is being present, presented. But because people are still sinful, and when there is sin, there is restriction. And when there is restriction, there appears to be scarcity. 
But the scarcity is not due to the fact that there are too many people. The scarcity is due to the fact that people are sinful. And therefore, sinful activities bring about scarcity and various types of calamities coming from material nature in the forms of wars, pestilence, and various other forms of calamities. And this is nicely pointed out by Srila Prabhupada in one verse in the seventh canto where he presents this as a result of the sinful nature of the population. So as Krishna consciousness is, increases around the world and people become more religious and pious and start to work under the, under the guise of saintly principles rather than economic principles, economic principles are simply meant in order to profit a, the handful of a, a few powerful people in order to increase their uh, control and then their wealth around the world. And therefore people are suffering, <coughs> the people are suffering. And therefore, and of course, the whole idea is that uh, uh, the activities of sinful life go on every day as, uh, as uh, what we say, a way of life, just like you see many of the entertainment that you find on, on the media centers around violence, violence and various sexual exploits. So this is being presented mainly, so much of it is presented mainly as the forms of entertainment and news that go on the world. So you can see that how this will affect people's consciousness. I remember one man, he, he, he did something really horrible to his wife. I guess there was some difficulty in the family that he decided to kill his wife. So he took some gasoline and threw it all over her and then threw a match and lit her on fire. Now, later on when he was, uh, taken to jail and questioned and so many, he, he said, actually, he saw this whole thing on television in one television series and he thought it was a good idea. <laughs> of course, obviously the man was insane, but this insanity is being propagated in the name of, um, well, what we say, entertainment like that. So what we get today in today's world is a, uh, there are sinful activities are going on and people are being encouraged in that way. And when the earth somehow shows scarcity because of the lack of religiousness, lack of piety, the lack of moral, you know, turpitude, a lack of mm, spirituality, then people will suffer. I was just reading in one article written by a very senior devotee in our movement that the exploitation of the earth for resources is 50% more than what the earth is producing every year. So the earth is producing so much, but people are using more than they're producing. So again, people will say, well, that's the, the idea is just to reduce the population. No, that's not the solution, nor is it any, any what we say, sensible people, person will accept, accept that, that, you know, who's gonna be that population you reduce? And then that's another thing. The other thing is that they, uh, the point is that this, um, these sinful activities, if they're counteracted and people become pious and religious and engage in spiritual activity, as Prabhupada has continuously mentioned, the earth can produce so much uh, uh, in abundance, in abundance. What we have today, just like now, they try to artificially increase the, the growth 
of vegetables and fruits on the trees by GMO mo modification. And uh, they try to produce faster than the earth is actually de developing in order to get more and sell more. And it looks, sometimes it looks very nice, but you see the quality of such food is not only uh, can be harmful to the health, but at the same time, it's artificial. And the, uh, the taste of the food is no longer to its maximum if it were allowed to grow naturally under, under the laws of material nature. So, um, so the, the theory that goes on in the world today, and it's a big theory, is that we need to reduce the population. And this is the whole thing. And because there are 7 billion people in the world and the earth cannot supply and nor can the governments and the uh, corporations manage such sizable populations. So better to make it manageable and uh, more controlled through a reduction of the population. So this is demoniac, obviously. It's not something that is will be accepted by any sensible or any intelligent human being, but this is what goes on. You create a problem and then you create another problem to try to solve the first problem. But the solution is not in reduction of population. The solution is an increase of spirituality and piety and sacrifice like that. And uh, as long as there's greed in the world, uh, especially from coming from those in higher places, there will always be these inequalities and false theories about how to rearrange the world in order to make it so-called livable. This is all uh, what is being presented to us as a way of life by the present materialistic societies. Okay, so I wanted to cover this point because I think it's very important that we understand that scarcity does not come because of overpopulation. Scarcity comes from a lack of spirituality and a sinful population. And uh, excess exploitation of Mother Earth for useless products. You can see, you go around the world, you see there are huge stores and, and gigantic malls filled with materials that have been ravaged from the Earth. And a lot of this stuff, people don't even buy. It just sits on the shelf. They throw it away or they give it away or so the earth is going through a very difficult time and therefore the earth is reacting by uh, creating difficulties for the population as Prabhupada said nature is the distributor of the benefits that the population is meant to receive nature is the punisher of the of the of the uh, reactions that the citizens are about to give. It's coming through the hands of material nature, coming ultimately from God who arranges the laws of material nature. So when people are conscious or devotional, at least piet, pieties, there is always enough, every, enough everything in, in the world and people can live happily without ex excess uh, struggle in order to get the necessities of life. Okay, so um, I'll stop there and see if there's any comments or questions. Thank you Guru Maharaj for uh, selecting this extremely relevant and uh, important verse. This is very timely given the climate of uh, the discussion that is taking place everywhere, especially about overpopulation. We hear a lot about this, that the earth is overpopulated and that's why all these problems. So thank you so much for spelling out very clearly for us that the solution is spirituality. Thank you. 
Yeah, this is Prabhupada's uh, statements over and over again. The earth is the is the gift of God, and she can produce unlimitedly when pop when the population follows the laws of God. There's no question of overpopulation. That's just some false theory. Dear devotees, my humble obeisances to all of you. I humbly request that we uh, ask questions of Guru Maharaj to clarify further so that we can take up these principles ourselves and then help people around us who desperately need to hear all these wonderful transcendental knowledge from the Vedic scriptures to better themselves and better this world. Please come forward to ask questions. Thank you so much. Hi Krishna Guru Maharaj, may I ask a question? Please accept my humble obeisances. Yes, Mother Prem Kishori, Hare Krishna. August to Shri Prabhupada, August to you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for the very nice and relevant uh, discussion on the verse. But Guru Maharaj, the practical application is something which I don't know yet. I don't know how to apply this in my own life because. Currently, we are seeing an uh, overwhelming number of uh, disease, overwhelm like it is. it may not be overwhelming for someone. I understand it's a relative term that, um, that is overwhelming for me, but it may not be overwhelming for someone else who has seen much more than this. But for me, it is overwhelming as a, uh, as a, as a human being and especially as a as a practicing physician that you have a body under your hand and the person just dies. And this is a lot, it's, a, it's happening a lot. So, so how should I process that particular moment? The thing that you just said, okay, this, okay, I understand that this person was supposed to have these many breaths given by Krishna and there's got to be some reason for a soul to leave the body, but it does leave me with a significant amount of traumatic experience which I have not been able to process with the use of scriptures also? Um, well, um, I, I'm not sure how I should approach the answer to your question. Is it based on karma or based on your own personal experiences that you are, have to face in dealing with people who are departing right in front of your eyes? What, what angle do you want me to discuss this on? I'm not sure. I don't know either, Guru Maharaj. I didn't think in that perspective, but a general, uh, a general insight of what I should um, do to enhance my own Krishna consciousness, because it does upsets me. Uh, I, well, I get back. It takes time. You, you are you're a, you're a doctor, right? Yes, good manage. You're mostly pediatrician, right? Or is, do you you work in other fields too? Mostly pediatrician, and that's why it is very harmful. But right now, for COVID, we are working in uh, for adults too, up to the age of thirty. Mm -hmm. So you're trying to help people who are affected by the virus and and then in your attempt because it's it's not always successful people are dying and it's becomes a little emotionally disturbing uh yes guru maharaj and we are also doing a telemedicine with india so it's mostly so we're treating patients in India also with telemedicine. So in the present situation, so everything is like um, a bit too much. Well, I am, I'm not going to justify, you know, the, uh, the situation. All I'm, I can say is this, what brought it about is 
as Prabhupada mentions in the seventh canto, when sinful activities increase across the planet, reactions come in the form of war, famine, and various other kinds of material calamities when it becomes uh, full blown. And he also mentions pestilence too. So that's what we have right now. There is this uh, disease that is floating around and it's taking the lives of many. But um, uh, as a doctor, you have to ready yourself for the, the consequences. Uh, if you become distraught, how can you actually do your work effectively? You have to be a little bit, uh, as a devotee, the devotees are sensitive. It says that the devotee feels the sufferings of others and enjoys the happiness of others. That's the nature of a devotee. So you're working in a situation where it's become almost routine to see people dying every day. <laughs> so uh, I don't know what to tell you, just that you can somehow or other ready yourself for that. Or if you can't handle it emotionally, then you might want to distance yourself from that. Okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, but as far as karma is concerned, we can't really see how karma is working in these situations. As yeah. Prabhupada said, as Prabhupada said, um, the doctor is there and the patient is there. And if the patient is meant to die, the doctor, no matter how expert you care is, it's not going to change. And if the patient is meant to live, then even if the care is not up to standard, the patient will live. So the ultimate doctor is behind the scenes and that is the Supreme Lord's hand that he works through the material energy. Um, yes, Guru Maharaj, but it's just the practical application of the, of, the, of the statement is something which I'm working on because I'm forced to face it. Yeah. Yeah, just if you you have to strengthen yourself with the tolerance and the expectation that you do your best to try to save the lives of these people. And that's your service and that's your dedication. It's a compassionate, uh, sir, it's a compassionate profession, but you can expect that it's not always going to be successful. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Prem Kishori, for asking that very important question. I think uh, many of us also in the caregiving role grapple with these things. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for giving us the spiritual perspective so that we can process it through and see things through the eyes of scripture. Thank you very much. Dear devotees, if you have further questions on this very important subject, which is very relevant for our times, please come forward and ask. Thank you. Dear Guru Maharaj, Vishani and Navni Chor Das is asking on chat, Hare Krishna Maharaj, if someone dies as a result of this virus, is it untimely death? Um, well, as long as we have a material body, death will come. Timely or untimely, it's, it's, it depends on that person's karma. We don't really, we don't see. Generally, the law of karma works in such a way as that, um, of course, Prabhupada also say, if you're not careful, you will be affected. Just like devotees are generally not sinful. We're not contributing to 
the sinful climate of the world. But still, if devotees are not careful and get careless in the way they live, they can also get sick. There's no question about that. So we have to be just like if you're standing on a corner and you have to cross the street, you have to take precautions in crossing the street. If you're a little inattentive and careless, you could get hit by a car or you could come close to get hit by a car. So the material world is a very dangerous place the way it is. And so one has to take proper care, but one has to depend on Krishna. So if you're remembering Krishna all the time, or as much as you can, you'll be protected from Krishna, but through the, through the intelligence he gives you and directly through his personal protection that he gives to the devotees. Both will be there. But if we're, if we're careless and we forget Krishna and we act a, a little less attentively, we can be victimized. Whether we die or not, that's another thing. That's another thing. And death is in the hands of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Although he works through the agency of the material energy. Yeah. So it's hard to see. In fact, it's impossible to see a person's karma like that. Just like there is one type of karma called mass karma, M-A-S-S, -S, mass. That means just like you see a plane crash and there'll be 250 people on the plane and they all die on the crash. So is that some chance or that some of the people on the plane just happened to be there and therefore they died? Or is it everybody's karma? Basically the scriptures say that um, when, a particular reaction will come in a person's life. It may come instantly, it may come delayed, or it may come in a very delayed way, like many lifetimes later, depending on the situation. That's where, that's why Krishna, when he's when asked about karma, he doesn't really get into the details of karma because he says the intricacies of, two, of karma are too difficult to understand and too difficult to understand how the interaction of a person's consciousness with their desires and their life's activities produces a particular result. And he explained that to um, Maharaj um, Dhritarashtra. When Dhritarashtra asked Krishna why he had to go through all that suffering, why all his sons were killed and why he was born blind, all these things. And Krishna answered a question explaining about his previous lives, which he had committed sinful activities and, and now the fruits of those activities were cashing in. So we can't see, but we, we accept. But then again, doctors and other people who are involved in trying to save lives can save lives if Krishna empowers that person to save that life. In other words, it's up to Krishna. This, to, to put Krishna outside and make it everything mechanical and say things are happening by these arrangements, we're not seeing the whole picture. As Prabhupada said, no one can do good to anyone on any level unless Krishna sanctions it. So Krishna works through the material energy to give people their karma and their rewards, the rewards, either good or otherwise. But we can't see that, nor can we see a person's history of why they're put into that situation. Sometimes very good people appear to die a very quick or traumatic death, but we don't know what was their previous lives what, what they had done previously. So what is happening now doesn't necessarily indicate the results of the reactions they're getting. It could be due to what they've done in previous lives. 
there was that famous book, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Written by one um, rabbi whose son was born with a very rare disease called progeria. A progeria takes a person through their whole life <clears throat> quickly. So his son died at the age of 14 from the effects of old age. His body deteriorated so fast. And that is a rare disease. It's in the world today. It's in rare places, <clears throat> mostly in places in Africa. But uh, when he experienced that, he couldn't understand why he was a man of God. And this son of his had never done anything wrong. And he had to go through that. So he concluded that uh, God is all good, but he's, all, he's not all powerful. And this book became the number one bestseller uh, for many, many years. People were looking for the answer, why do bad things happen to good people? But we wrote a rebuttal. One of our senior devotees, who was actually Ravinda Prabhu, wrote a rebuttal on the book. And later on, he published that in the form of a book showing that bad things don't happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people because we can't see their karma from previous lives like that. But devotees are not under the influence of karma. They're under the influence of Krishna's care. And so they also may experience some difficulties, but not in the proportion of the activities. They get a slight reaction. But still, we should never be careless and think, well, I'm protected by Krishna. It doesn't matter what I do. Or No, we have to be careful. Don't give Krishna a lot of problems just to try to save you because you're careless. <laughs> That's what Prabhupada would say. Don't give Krishna a lot of extra work if you're not... He, like, he wants to save his devotee, but if his devotees don't act properly, then they will still get some suffering for their reactions. Like that. So when it comes to karma, you can't really uh, pinpoint it unless you can actually see a person's lives from previous lives, who they were in their previous lives, what have they done, what are they doing now. Uh, it's not possible to conclude based on what you see in front of you. It's just, you can't see the whole picture. Yes, thank you very, very much, Maharaj. Um, cleared quite a few things because I was asked this question. And I, I said, it's everybody's karma that we take the last breath because we come with that many breaths here. So, um, and they, they said, um, then the karmas that have not been fructified or they haven't suffered the karmas, they'll be suffering in the next life. And I said, yes, but if they get the opportunity to serve the Lord, then their karmas will be a little bit less than what we, you know, the intensity, intensity will be less, is all I could say. Less. Yes. Much less. And yes. Prabhupada even used the example that a person may have been a murderer and then they come to Krishna consciousness and then Prabhupada said, then you get, you get a slight reaction, you cut your finger or something. Yes. So that's a drastic reduction of the reaction of the activity one performs. That's the power of devotional service. Yes, that's it. Yeah, you, you, so. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very, very much. Mm -hmm. um, Guru Maharaj, we have Susanna asking a question on the chat. She says, Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble respectful obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> when, when not successful in saving someone, is it possible to offer that issue to the Lord? And is there a certain prayer that we can say in this case? Thank you. Your servant, Susanna. When we're not successful in what? <laughs> in saving someone. Mm -hmm. Well, as we explained,
explain. No one can save anyone unless Krishna empowers that person to do it. We can try. Our efforts will, will bring about the mercy of Krishna. But if still, if Krishna doesn't want, then it, it won't happen. Ultimately, the hand of the Lord is the is the the ultimate principle that makes everything happen. But still, on our level, we have to act. We have to do our best. We have to provide the best opportunity and the best facilities and the best care to try to help people. And that effort will bring about the mercy of the Lord in one form or another. But ultimately, it's up to him. Prabhupada makes that point over and over again. The doctor cannot save the patient, no matter how expert the doctor is, unless Krishna wants that person to be saved. Is it all right, Susanna? Do you have any further questions? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances or go with the Srila Prabhupada. Thank you for um, explaining this and I really need that today. And I'm very grateful for this lesson. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Uh, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances again. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you, Guru Maharaj. I have a question on this particular verse. I'm wondering whether certain governments will then justify cow killing and slaughter of animals saying there's a famine here, there's a drought here. And so we are going to allow people to eat meat and you know kill animals when they should actually be engaging in getting relief in the form of maybe importing food grains or trying to make arrangements so that people have food grains and proper food and they justify slaughterhouses on this basis. Well, they don't have to even do that because they already, people have already accepted that meat eating is a part of, of uh, eating. And therefore, the propaganda that goes out is that it's good for you. They don't even see it as an excuse. They just directly put it out. That would be an emergency situation when people become more pious and religious and then the, then the, the people who want to propagate would use such, such theories. But they're not even doing that now because they don't have to. Of course, the, the amount of people who take to vegetarianism daily is increasing all around the world that's increasing more and more because people are knowing the at least the health detriments that come by way of eating meat but people are not aware of the karmic reactions if they were aware of the karmic reactions they would be even they would even be more vegetarians <laughs> but you know, you're fighting the propaganda of the news media, which puts out that this is acceptable. The media industry and the medical industry are very two very powerful industries in the world. They have a big say in government. You have to understand our governments are not run by politicians. They're run by the, they're, they're run by the entrepreneurs the big corporations. Whatever the corporations dictate, mm -hmm. they use their power to influence government policies. <laughs> we are a corporate state. We're not a, in a, in a political state. Yes, good so it's all, it's all about It's all about economics. <laughs> so Guru Maharaj, how can as we long, talk about? I'm sorry. As long as there is the I, there's the, this, the element of greed, these these uh, big play corporations will try to, you know, 
propagate more and more ideas how to make money. The medical industry is one of the biggest ones of making billions of dollars on this whole COVID thing with these vaccines. I have a further question, Guru Maharaj. How do we talk about karmic reactions to people who have no idea about what they're doing, you know, when they're eating meat? No. We, can no, we you don't talk want... about it or we shouldn't talk about it? Yes, and that comes by way of discussion with people who have some understanding. But gen people in general, you just try to present Krishna consciousness, that's all. So even uh, talking about karma that is involved in meat eating is not a good idea. It's just better to simply if talk it about comes, it. If it comes up as a subject, all you have to do is understand what Srila Prabhupada has given us. We take the words of Srila Prabhupada and the previous Acharyas. We read them, we get an understanding, and then we can explain them. But if we don't read or don't have an understanding, then it becomes hard to uh, speak in convincingly. But it's not a subject matter for you know, for general discussion, and if it comes up, and then you have to be ready to, you know, know the answer and present, present the answer as given by Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada is our lifeline for all the information we need on any area. Yes, good. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, is that, have we reached conclusion yet? <laughs> uh, it doesn't look like there are any more questions, uh, Guru Maharaj, on the chat either. Okay, so we can stop here. Yes, Guru Maharaj, thank you so much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj, thank Hare you. Krishna. Oh, hi, well, hi, well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, what, what a surprise ending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Anjali, Jai Radha, and Parma Karuna all together. Anasuya. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Very well, Srinivas Ji. Lavanya. Lavanya is our, our, our uh, coordinator of all the activities that we try to do here in order to preach Krishna consciousness. You are you're an expert in making things go on. <laughs> Thank you. Krishna Maharaj. Srinivas, how, how, oh, Aribo, who's that? Hare Vishalini. Oh, Vishalini, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much. Srila Prabhupada, Gidai, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Anjali. Hare Paul. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Shamarani. Hare Krishna Maharaj.